conversation. First, we have cinematographer Mandy Walker. to this film um, as painstakingly as you all recreated it uh, and, and really tried to translate Elvis's life to the screen? Well, you know one thing? Um, from the very beginning, right, I mean, this goes back a long way, whether it was, you know, the time in living in Memphis, the, the office at Graceland, the, tracking down of people, the, you know, all of it, the journey, making the movie, always, always, always. The one thing that was foremost in all of our minds was, and this is to do with Elvis, was we were making a theatrical movie for the theatre, like for the cinema. And that was our mission. And I remember standing on a stage in Vegas, you know, when, when all the exhibitors get together, you know, 3,000 of them, and saying, I promise you, no matter what, you know, we'll go not just to New York. It sounds like I was running for the primary election. You know? <laughs> not just to New York and not just to LA, but we'll come to Arizona, which we did, right? We'll do anything to get audiences of all ages and backgrounds into the theatre. And I was lying through my teeth. I had no idea whether we'd be able to do that. That happened, and that's what's gratifying. We made a show for the theatre and audiences of all age groups have come. And I think it's because um, the story of Elvis in the end, like, is a theatrical, like, on stage, he makes people feel like you're at a rock concert, yeah. Well, Austin, it was your job, but also responsibility, but also um, probably honour uh, to, to do that, to, to make people feel things. What do you remember about your first experiences with Elvis as a child and, and what what his music made you feel? Wow, well, I, I uh, so I grew up my, with, around my grandmother a lot and she, she was in high school in 56 so she always had his music of the 50s on and my dad was a big Turner Classic Movies fan so we always had that on and he, he would have Elvis movies on all the time and uh, so that was that was my experience as a kid, uh, but I didn't know much about his life. So that was the real joy for me was uh, peeling back all those ideas of him and getting down to who he was as a human. That's that was what was really fascinating for me. Well, tell me a little bit about that process of interpretation as you started to kind of dig into Elvis's life and, and peel back those layers. What was something that you really kind of attached to? Well, yeah. For me, it was, it was learning, I mean, there's certain things, like I've talked a lot about our mothers, you know, learning that he lost his mom at the same age that I was when my mom passed away. Um, but it was the sensitivity of him and the, and the spirituality of him. And, uh, and, he, and it was, you know, little keys in, like, reading uh, that great book, Being Elvis, A Lonely Life, where in the first chapter, they, they tell the story of him, uh, where he didn't want to go to sleep alone at night later on in his life. And so he would ask his backup singer every now and then to come up and, and sit with him by his bedside. And he would say things like, do you think you'll come to my funeral? And am, am I just going to be forgotten after I die? And, uh, you know, my greatest regret is that I, I never made a classic film that will be remembered. And 
he felt that he would just be forgotten or something. And, um, so that, that the, the extreme confidence that you see when he walks out on stage, but then the self-doubt and the stage fright and the fear and the sensitivity, and he's just such a dynamic person. So getting to, uh, getting to explore that for the length of time that I did was just was, was a real joy. for you when you when you start out trying to do that you know it is one of the most tragic parts of, of this film when he says that that he's, he's worried that he'll be forgotten um, you're making a film that is proving that he hasn't been where did you start what what was the first thing that inspired you well you know um, I, he was in my life as a kid and then I moved on to Bowie and people like that <laughs> much more scared David and everything um, but um, about 10 years ago, I always thought, oh, Elvis has had the most impossible life. He's such a great canvas on which to explore things. Now, I've always been a great admirer of Shakespeare, who would take someone, let's say, like Richard II, and explore a larger human idea. You know, the more available example of that for me would be like Amadeus, you know? It's researched about Mozart. Salieri's in it, but there's this preposterous idea in it that Salieri somehow gets Mozart to write the death requiem for his father to murder, you know, my killed, you know, Mozart. You know, it's silly, but through that preposterous notion, we learn about human jealousy, you know? And so therefore, it's just not a historical lesson because it's only ever someone's telling it. You learn a big emotional idea. Now, I was thinking, how could Elvis do that? And I've always had a fascination in America in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And these two great American things. There's the, the American, there's the American soul in a way, and that is this giant boiling pot and these different cultures and new things are born. And young Elvis, who happens to be born in one of the, uh, who lives for a time anyway in one of the few white houses in the black community. And that story, by the way, that you see in the gospel tent, I found that man at like 80. Sam Bell, the little boy. And it took me a long time to find him. And he told me that story verbatim. And so you see this little boy, um, you know, uh, enmeshed in black culture, gospel, but also country and western, and he's forming something new. So that's America, the new, you know? And then you have this other thing with an S called the cell. You know, the carnival barker, the roll up, the put your name on everything. Come on, folks, you know? The guy that can pull the wool over your eyes and you know you're being done over, but you kind of enjoy it. And that's called snowing, the snowman. And that's when I got the idea of the colonel. Never colonel, never Tom, never Parker, colonel. That one. The great snowman. I mean, I couldn't get into even all the detail on the real colonel, you can't imagine what an out there crazy, like like a clown with a chainsaw sort of character he was, you know? <laughs> like this guy could suck the air out of any room he was in. And you know what? He had a club called the Snowman's League and the president of the United States, LBJ, was a member of that club. That's how out there he was, right? And I just thought, ah, oh, that's my Salieri. Like you've got the great carnival seller who's kind of a genius, has a deep, dark secret. He's sort of evil, but everyone loves him. And then you have this pure soul. And the more I got into Elvis, it's actually, I can never, no one knows more about Elvis Presley than that guy there. And believe you me, I've tried to outdo him. <laughs> no, no one does, they just don't. And, and it isn't just because Oster's read every book and two years stayed in character and never wrote character and all of that and saw everything. He somehow managed to to discover the man's soul. And that's the key thing. The cell and the soul. And there's one thing I discovered about Elvis Presley. I mean, his love of gospel, like, that, that even, like you said, even when he was dying, three in the morning with the sweet inspirations, after two shows, singing gospel. That was his safe place. So it was about, for me, the cell and the soul. And I thought, oh, this, this could be worth putting out there, because. Right now, we're all about the cell. Too much cell, yeah. Will we get a chance to see both your soul, Austin, and, and Elvis's at the end, particularly of this film, um, in that, that really haunting 
Unchained Melody moment. Mandy, I want to come to you with this first because that was a big part of what you all aimed to do, which was to recreate these moments to the exact frame. Um, what went into that one in particular? Well, because uh, there's quite a few sequences in this movie that you can go online and see, and and you can and anyone can go and watch it now, and we wanted to um, replicate those exactly for an audience. Um, starting with Austin, of course, and his choreography, and then it, um, it was the art department, and for me, it was uh, getting the exact camera angles and the exact lensing, and we walked around on the sets many times with, you know, tape measures and seeing the, have the movies on an iPad and say, well, there was a camera here, and then they zoom in now, and then there was the lighting, I had to replicate exactly the same lighting, and um, for the 68 special, the NBC show, in particular, and um, and the Hilton Ballroom, and uh, then there was also Rustwood, which was documented by um, a stills photographer called Alfred Wertheimer, and he also took some 16 mil footage. So we had reference of that. So a lot of my pre-production was going through all of that material, and then being with Baz in the art department, costume and hair, and then um, being with Austin as he rehearsed and. Uh, and then um, I scoured the whole of Australia finding <coughs> uh, period lighting for the TV studio and um, fixing it and then putting some of our LED lighting in there as well and, and being able to incorporate that together. Um, and we even put one of our 65mm cameras in a, in a housing of a TV camera so it would be in exactly the right position on exactly the right angle and be able to be shot. <coughs> but then uh, there's the... The, one of the things that Baz had said to me very early on when we started talking is he said, Mandy, the camera has to dance with Elvis. So it was about us rehearsing with Austin, learning the choreography. All my team had to learn the music, and um, which was, you know, camera operators, grips, everybody, lighting, dimmer board operators, everybody. So that kind of rehearsing together to get it um, to a point where Austin felt, you know, that we were with him on stage and we weren't going to crash into him and we knew his moves and we were going to move with him. Um, and to recreate, for instance, the, the Hilton, um, the ballroom, and we, were, we did, there's a film called That's Why It Is, and in that film they take um, Aus, uh, Elvis, Austin, they take Elvis <laughs> from backstage to side of the stage and on stage, and we shot that all in one go. We shot the whole concert in one go. We didn't stop and, and Austin went into the first four or five songs and we did it a few times but that, we did that and rehearsed that to be able to do it in one move and shoot the whole concert. I, 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 tell, I told the story before but I mean it's, it is, in, in all my experience of making movies, we've done lots of sort of things um, uh, because we rehearsed, 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 rehearsed it, right? And, um, so Austin, in that's the way it is, Elvis, Austin, Elvis, walks like this, around the back, goes on, it's exactly the same choice, comes on stage, and, and then the concert plays out, and does all these three numbers, and Austin does all the banter and everything, and it's like, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, there's this, I've told it before, we have a grip, his name Brett, he's worked with me 30 years, he might have said three words to me in 30 years, he was <laughs> something like, oh, watch out boss, you'll get you know, squashed by that. Right? <laughs> he might have said that to me, and he comes up to me after we finish the, the shoot, and he goes, Oh, boss, I, uh, mate, I've worked on Star Wars, uh, I've worked on the Theory of Line with Terry Malick, your Superman, so I've done them all, I mean, I've done them all, but well, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, my hands were shaking, I think I might have shaken the camera. <laughs> he said it was, it was, I, I was, I was out of body experience, it was like I was there, I couldn't work. <laughs> and none of us, course, it was actually like we were there. You know, it was the most mind blowing thing. It was special for a second because a lot of people might think oh yes you know we're gonna make this movie we'll ease in we'll maybe we'll shoot you know a big dialogue scene or something to begin with um I know it was early in the shoot but exactly how early did you all shoot the 68 comeback special the first day yeah, yeah. Of course. yeah. we did a pre-day where we where we did the tests the, I think the shaving of the head oh yeah we did one it was like we were doing tests anyway but I didn't have to say anything yeah he had his head cut 
And so we yeah. did that. I think that was the very first day. It was almost like a, yeah. a camera test. Day. It was, yeah. And then, yeah. and then the next day was 60th special. And from so I had a year and a half of preparation. And uh, I this there had been no other thing in my life that I focused on. And but that responsibility that you feel right before walking out was so immense uh, because you kind of realize that all the work that Mandy's been doing, Baz has been doing, every CM and, and everybody who's creating these incredible sets and dressing every one of our supporting artists, and all of that work is, is to be captured between action and cut. So that's the moment of truth and that's it's a terrifying weight that you feel. And I was in the dressing room beforehand and I, my hands were shaking and I was just thinking, I don't know if I, what if I fail? You know, if, if I fail bad, and if I, so many people have trusted me, and if this doesn't go well, I may never work again. <laughs> you know, the, the, and, and then it dawned on me that that's exactly the emotion that Elvis was having. That, that this was a make or break moment in his career. And so those emotions were not something that he wasn't feeling. I didn't have to push him away. Instead, I could say, all right, this is energy. What do I do with this? And, and I went out there and you know, I'd never performed in that way. I mean, Baz had curated these experiences for me to perform, you know, in Nashville or whatever beforehand, but never where you know it's gonna be in the film. And, uh, and I went out there and the work that everybody had put in allowed me, I mean, what CM did with the production design and with the costumes and I've seen that footage a million times. And I'm looking down and I walk out onto the stage and I see the audience and they're all dressed identically. And uh, just like you, look at you. Yeah, Elvis shirt and all. I, uh, and, and then the music started. And I looked into a girl's eyes and I saw her blush. And then I saw somebody else smile. And I, 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 so suddenly I felt what it felt like to have rapport with an audience. And that then fed me and then I fed them. And, and I look down at my arm and I see the leather on my arm and I see the rings on my fingers and the identical microphone in my hand and it felt like I was looking out of Elvis's eyes and I, nobody since he's done that has had such an authentic experience and so I had a completely out of body transcendental experience where I just lost myself and just allowed, allowed it to just kind of happen and it was one of the greatest joys I've ever had on set. I wasn't worried. No, I wasn't, I wasn't worried about that. I'll tell you why. And I mean it in a genuine way. I mean, I, well, I, I, I was just with Mandy worrying about can we get the cameras dead right and all that. And the reason I wasn't worried is I think, um, you know, I, I come from an acting teaching background. And, and you know, the ensemble of actors, that's really, really important. But I extend that out to the world. Like, you know, it's called play acting or a screenplay, we are but players. And you can't play, children can't play if they're frightened. So the number one thing I do is, I mean, Mandy was, we started like so early, like Mandy was at the workshops with Austin before we even met him. Like, we start so early that by the time we get there, like I don't have extras in my movies. Every single person on that set had a background. Like support actors, you can be the one right up there you already have a character breakdown in your costume. You know who you are at every single play. You know? And there are no, um, you know, and, and you know, someone said the other day, oh, it was Peter Weir, we were honoring him. He, was, he, he taught me how to direct, you know. Um, when I did Studio Boring, he said, you know, you look in the bit, not with the glass at the front, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, he was reminding him, he said, I wish we just called Crew because Really, it's kind of like we're all in it together, and whether you're an actor or you're Brett the Grip or all of that, the number one thing is to create a, a full and complete ensemble, a total environment where fear is kept away and we can all play. Very seriously work, but play. That's the number one thing, you know? So I know that the environment was right. I knew that you were ready. There was a little frisson going in there. Um, but all I can think was, all I can think of many is, gee, did we hit the mark exactly like they did in the 68? But I, thought, I knew you were going to be brilliant, you know. 
Then did he hit the note? <laughs> oh yes, every time, exactly. Well, I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for some audience questions as well. So, oh, that was real fast. So I think we're going to go to you first here, and we'll be keeping an eye out as well over here. Boy, have I got a story for you. <laughs> I mean, are you ready? I am. Okay, I think you know the one. Because, he knows. Because there was this sequence. And this is a great, this is, this is good, this is good. Um, even from the workshops, before officially, I mean, I, uh, me knowing it was Austin, I have to convince other people to get them secure. Anyway, long journey. But it's always training for that moment this training and preparation, preparation and training and all of that, for that moment when you know that you're gonna have to go on instinct. And we had a sequence where Elvis, um, he is inspiring the orchestra, this is what Elvis actually did, using like, okay, this is how we're gonna do my new number, you know, the one, da da da, okay band, do this, da da da, that one, right? We had a tape that we developed a year earlier and Austin practiced to the tape, I know, for a year? Is it a year? Like a year of him miming that. And also, every musician on stage, even though they were musicians, all their instruments were muted. So the drum would go, and the drum couldn't make any noise. It looked like they were doing it. You know, they were miming. Everybody was miming, right? And we're rolling, action, remember, man, I'm rolling, and we do a take. And I'm like, for the first time, I mean, we've already done comeback, we've done Vegas. For the first time, I go, we're in trouble here. And I'm like, I never show it, of course. I'm like, mm. And I'm thinking, like, I could tell. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, mmm. You know, encouraging, going like, okay, that's interesting, yeah. And also looked over to me, because he went like, and I could see him going ashen. And I went, yeah. Let's try that one more time. We do one more time. And I, then I'm like, mmm. And it was crystally clear it was not working at all. At all. So I said, Oh, it's not working. And I said, What if we did it for real? Right? And then I said, Look, they're all musicians. You know how Elvis would do it. You know how to do it. You just be Elvis, and I'll undo the things, and you go out and you stand next to it, and until you get the music out of those musicians, you Elvis. So you make a great piece of music. Elvis doesn't know what it's gonna sound like at the end. You make that music for real, right? And I think you went away. Well, no, at this point, you said, all right, uh, I said, you know, okay, all right, let's, let's go for it. And, and uh, in my mind, it's just this, this terror and this self-doubt and all this stuff happening. And, uh, cause you, you, that's the thing, you like, you prepare. You work so hard to try to find the perfect way, and this was this turned out to be such a good lesson for acting. You you, you try to prepare to like do a scene perfectly, and uh, and then we get there and you're hitting all the beats, but the life isn't there. And so Baz said this to me, and then and then said, "All right, let's do another take." We unmuted all the instruments, and we and he calls action, and I went to the piano player and. I had in my mind that, that perfect way that it was supposed to go, which is I spend four bars with the piano player and then I move on to the bass and player and I move on to the guitar and I, I work my way through. But what I did was I, I spent those four bars with the piano player. He didn't get it right, but I moved on. And then I move, and I move on to the bass player. He doesn't get it right. I move on to the guitar player. It's a cacophony now. And I'm just, I'm feeling sick to my stomach, but you gotta keep pushing forward. And so I'm, I'm going forward with this, and we get to the end, and it was like all the air in the room felt like it was sucked out. And I felt, that was, that was the only moment where I really thought I was gonna have a panic attack. And uh, I just, I, like a complete nervous breakdown, I felt like I was on the verge of it. And then, and then afterwards, you know, after a take, everybody comes up to you, and so you got like, people touching your face and doing your hair, and working on your clothes and it's just it's so much and and uh, I, I said you know what guys could I just have 10 minutes 
and I went into a, a room in the back, and I don't even think you knew what I was really doing. But no, I, I just thought you were having 10 minutes. Yeah, so I left, and I went back, and I had a full-on pep talk as Elvis in the mirror, and I said, you know how this music should sound. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror and going, it doesn't matter if you spend 10 minutes with that piano player, you get him to play the song that you hear in your head. And I, and I, I talked myself for a while, and I went back and I said, okay, I'm ready. And you called action, and then I went, and I spent as long as I needed with that piano player, and, and then suddenly you start hearing the beauty of the music come together, and then I started just, things just started coming out, like the flames are coming off the guitar, all that. I, there's just, just things that I was saying, and it was, it was suddenly I was like having that rapport like I had with the audience, but with the band. And, uh, and that was a question I asked myself in the, when I first read the script. That I wrote at the top, I said, where is Elvis's genius? You know, like, he, he obviously, he had genius, and, but he never wrote a song. It was in the way that he orchestrated music, it was in the way that he performed, it was in, it was in his sensitivity in being able to connect to music in that way, it was, it was many things. Uh, but that moment then, I felt like I was clicking into, not, not me clicking into his genius, but clicking into the way that he made music. And uh, that was another one of those moments where I, we captured something that I wasn't expecting. You know, what was amazing was that Oz was there and it was all going and he'd be there like this. But, you know, the, the three actors playing the Sweet Inspirations, like, he would, like, he made it all up. Like, he'd go like, oh my god, and he's using his body like this, but not like that. Uh, <laughs> can you do it for me? Anyway, you know the way you wriggle the thing like that, with the belt, like that. And they were going like that, and they were getting so excited, and they were clapping, and then he goes, and it was so brilliant, it's so Elvis, like we, it was astounding. He went up to the bones, and he said, no, and he went, no, no, up the octave, right? And they, these guys could really play, they went, la la la, da da da, you know? And it was absolutely thrilling, and, and that's, that's what you see in the movie, yeah. you know? Yeah. That reality is what you see in the movie. I think you would have loved Star Wars. I really do. I think he probably would have loved Star Wars. Yeah. 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 Ye
love the Chewbacca character. That's a that's a good that's a good oh, note. Um, I think we've got time for just a couple more. So we're gonna grab one here. I think I see you in the yes on the end here in the kind of fourth row. Yes. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. What's what's your name? I'm Z. 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 Z, Z yeah. yeah. How are you? I'm Can we help you, Z? <laughs> I made all my family watch it, all my friends watch it, um, and then I have completely become obsessed with Elvis. I've now watched all of his movies. I even have ranked them on a spreadsheet of which ones I like more. <laughs> and my question now is, I know there's not going to be a four-hour cut anytime soon. We know that's not happening. But what do you think about releasing full performances for us? Well, I think rather than you having to spend a lot of money going to see a doctor, it might be better if I do that. Uh, no, see, in all seriousness, can I tell you? Uh, I just went through this kind of... In short, by the way, by the way, I thought of that, and I was thinking during this period, I mean, even just for myself, I mean, just to be really clear, any minute of the film, you've still got to build in a visual effect, you've got to grade it and all of that. So it's, you have to have the finance out. That would be Warner Brothers. Are we listening? Right. Uh, get behind it. But as this film grows in its kind of, I suppose, success, you know, the, the fact that young audiences have come to see it, 15 to 16 year olds, a big part of our audience, um, are real Elvis fans, but people who go like, I knew nothing about Elvis, I don't care about Elvis, you know, have gone into his life. So I can see a world, I thought actually, wouldn't it be great for all you guys to have the experience that only we had, which was to watch Austin do the entire concert. Yeah. You know? So I, I can't say exactly when because I've got to get through this, but I can say one thing, I can say one thing. There will come a day when we do that concert version of it. Yeah. Only for you, Z. I know, I, we, we really could do this all night. Um, but there was a review that was given um, by Priscilla Presley, who said that not only did she you know, love this movie and, and feel that you captured the soul of Elvis, but she also said that he, she believed he would have loved this movie. What, well, first of all, you know, what was your experience of hearing that and what does that the, I can tell you this because it's a very, uh, was really difficult. Um, I met with Priscilla and Lisa Maria, fantastic guy by the way, what a great young filmmaker um, and actor, but um, very briefly, they told me things and then we went off to make the film and I intended to keep more in contact. Now, it's very important to understand, they weren't giving me notes or they, they weren't counsel on the film. There was no control there, it was up to me to do the storytelling. But I lost connection with them because of the pandemic. I mean, we went off to Australia to make this for three months. I was in Queensland for two years. You know, I never left. And so there came a point, and I want everyone to understand that I never felt bad about this. I totally understood it. There were so many things to keep in the air, like getting through the pandemic and keeping the movie going and just the, all that. And uh, Priscilla started to get a bit vocal about how worried she was about it, you know, Baz can be a bit wacko, she's not wrong there, um, you know, uh, and how can this kid, Austin, play Elvis? No one could play Elvis, right? So at some point I'm making it, and we were about to go to Cannes, we'd been selected to Cannes, and seen it, and I went, I really want Priscilla at Cannes, I mean, it's, this is the right thing to do, but I was so not finished the movie, so I said, I said, what I'm gonna do, it is screen the movie. Now I'm flying and the plane is late. So I land and I immediately, like I'm still taxiing in and I let her say, uh, how'd it go? And I think Gail said like, um, there's a female security guard crying. And I went like, oh God, she's left. She goes, no, she's crying because Priscilla's crying. And I went, well, where's Priscilla? She said, she's still in there. We've been waiting here like 25 minutes. 
And then Priscilla left and I got an email that afternoon, because you can imagine, I've never been so sick in my stomach about a screening. And it said, um, you said, I know I was hard on you, something like that. So every move, every wink, every breath, everything, everything, everything he did. He said, if my husband was here, he'd say, hot damn, you are here. How did he do it? How did he do it? And then Lisa saw it and I was there for that and she was so emotional. She was like in a flood of tears. I had to carry her to the car. And there's lots of people all lined up the studio wanting to sit. She said, Do I have to talk to them? I said, No, it's just it's okay, you can get in the car. And then um, she said two beautiful things. Uh, now she said this one thing, she said, It's all gone now, all that. It's all gone. It's, it's, it's more personal, the stuff she said. But the other lovely thing she said at some point, she said, Eventually they all invite us down to Graceland, and Graceland is now a home. We have a barbecue, and we're there having cocktails in the jungle room. <laughs> you know, we've got part of the family, that was kind of beautiful, but she said, you know, I was really confused, because I really thought that was Dad singing in the first half of the movie. <laughs> I wondered how you got it so much. I said, no, it was Austin. Yeah. Yeah, that, it, was, it was everything, it was everything. Austin, what was your, what does it mean to hear that, um, to continue to get this, uh, just love from the person. And that was the greatest review I could ever hope for. I, I uh, you know, making the movie Baz and I talked very early on how you never know what the outcome of anything you create is gonna be. You never know how it's gonna be received. You never know if you're gonna capture it. So what we can do is we can revel in the process and we can do our best every day. And, uh, but then come those moments where you know Priscilla's gonna be watching the film and I just thought, what if she hates it? What if, and I hadn't watched the film. So I had no idea what she was even seeing. And then Lisa Marie, and, and I, I thought, you know, these are the, the, this is the family that I felt that responsibility every day that woke me up at three in the morning, that, that you know, I just wanted to find this humanity for them. And, uh, and it, was, it was hearing that, uh, Baz and I went to dinner and he read me that email from Priscilla and it just brought tears to my eyes. And then, and then I, had, I hadn't met Lisa Marie until, uh, until we screened the film in Grayson. And I, s I was walking down a hallway in the back as we were walking towards the screening room. And I saw her from across the hall and she looked at me and I looked at her and we both got tears in our eyes and she just came up and gave me this huge hug. And it was a really surreal thing because I had felt through Elvis so much love for her and so much sadness at having to, you know, uproot the family and all these things and say goodbye to her. And, um, and knowing that he left her too soon, and like, I felt so much love for her in this bizarre way through her dad. And she had witnessed the film and then felt emotions towards me in that way, and so immediately we felt like family. And it was, it was really beautiful, and, and so we just, she and I just hung out at Graceland a lot, and, and, uh, and she just told me stories of being upstairs with him, and how he was just upstairs, he was in his pajamas, and he was dead. And, you know, and then he come down as Elvis, and um, it was those types of things. I mean, I'll never, I'll never forget. 